So the thing about the DACA couple is um, we are the reluctant activists. This wasn't meant to happen. It wasn't meant to be us. It wasn't meant to be anything to do with us. But one day we got busted in a very, very heavy way. It was such a shock to us that you get treated in such a way by police for having dope on you that we decided after a long time, a few months, that this is what we had to do. It's not about cannabis. It's about our right to put into our body whatever we want, just like you. So that was in August 2010. So we fast heading for three years that we've been the DACA couple. And it's been an incredible journey because in the beginning, we didn't really even know anything about medical cannabis. Um, we didn't know very much at all about industrial cannabis. And we had to catch up with the facts and the truths from around the world really, really quickly. So it's kind of been like going back to university for us. It's been an incredible learning curve because we have to have the facts, facts on our fingertips all the time. Is it if you're bust or, or uh, you're in a situation, always tell the truth. If you bust and you start trying to tell a story about this and that and the other, it will come back to bite you. That's the message that we're putting out is that we have always told the truth and I think that that's one of the reasons why we've got this far, is we've always been frank and honest with everybody, with our supporters, with the prohibitionists, with the media. We've, we've been true to ourselves. Oh, yeah. Yes, we get a yeah, fair yeah. amount. I yeah, know people do, there's a section of society that really hates us and it drops you. You open your email up and there's a... Uh, there's some vociferous people about, not as many as there used to be. Now there is, now there is, there's an army on Facebook. There's like 17,000 people on Facebook now. And in the early days, people would come onto the page and say, you stupid bunch of stoners. But they can't actually say it to 17,000 people anymore. Yeah. Because the chances are that a vast percentage of 17,000 people aren't stupid stoners. We find that our, our main objections are, uh, are with moral issues. It's not a case of if, it, if it's right or if it's wrong or the facts or whatever. It's usually people, very conservative religious people, and then the worst are the ex-addicts who have become religious. Yeah, just because they made a big mistake and the drugs did them, they think everybody should be off drugs and they wake up every morning with a hard-on for a drug-free world. And it's just not going to happen, eh? So, uh, we're not going to get away from that one. Because those addicts want to blame something, or the families of those addicts want to blame something. And I firmly believe it's got, uh, totally rooted in, in drug education in schools. Mm -hmm. Because what they do is they send these ex-addicts, like a mad Steve guy, out to schools. I mean, we've met many of our supporters say, Oh no, that guy came and spoke to us when we were at school. He is so wrapped up in his addiction that he goes to schools every day and he reloads his addiction. He's never got over it. And now he's relying on that addiction to make a living. So emotionally, he is totally trapped in his addiction. And we've seen this with many, many people. They become drug counselors and then that becomes their whole life. They never move on. So that's why they blame the Dacha. Because the Dacha is the easiest one to blame because most people smoke Dacha. You know, people who, who eventually become addicts. I think that the key is to change the, the whole drug education thing in schools and to rather teach kids emotional intelligence because they, they, they preach at kids from up above and they say, don't do this, don't do that, it's going to ruin your life, whatever, instead of teaching kids how to make informed choices because it's ultimately it's their choice that is wrong if they get into the ugly drugs. So if we, if we teach kids emotional intelligence and how to stand up for what they believe in and how to make the right choices, then maybe we've got a, we've got a chance. But it's all, all of this addiction fear is well, really, that, that, that's the root of a lot of the problems in drug education. You know, that's, <laughs> there's only really two of, there's only two of us. Yeah. And we get an average of about 40 emails a day. So the administration of the case and that is certainly our biggest, our biggest challenge. Uh, it's very difficult to find people to help us who 
who have their hearts in the right place. People will help us sporadically for a week here, a week there, or for an event or whatever, but to actually get permanent people to help us who, who are uh, bright and interested and dedicated is quite a challenge. Yeah, it's definitely it's is a reality. reality. Um, we are not going to stop at anything. We know that we've got one chance because this is such a big case and it's going to get so much attention and the, the final judgment in the Constitutional Court is fairly binding because that will then create the ultimate precedent. And if they just throw it all out and whatever, then the chances of somebody else being able to get it right is quite slim. So we really believe that we've got a very good chance because of the Bill of Rights and, and, and the fact that it's a human rights issue and because we've got one of the most liberal constitutions in the world. So we stand a very good chance. We think it's going to take at least another three years. We think we'll be in the High Court by the first half of next year. And um, after that, it's anyone's guess, maybe another 18 months to two years to get to the Constitutional Court. The people, for yeah. sure, the people we meet on the journey along the way. You know, we've met some classic cases, and eh? we've met some people who let the drugs do them, and we've met such enlightened beings that are on a mission to help us right the way to the Constitutional Court. I think we spent the first um, 18 months to two years of our campaign building up our online presence, and uh, you know, we have amazing support. So that was an important foundation. And then uh, this year in January, we had a movie job that fell through and we said, right, we're going to Cape Town because we've got to do it right now. So we left on the 6th of February, we came back on, at the end of February. We, we did Cape Town, up the garden route, all the way through to Grahamstown, PE's London and, and uh, King Williamstown. And that was, we really felt like a, our campaign had kicked off when we hit the road. Um, that was our first big highlight in terms of public appearances. We did 10 presentations in 17 days, and in those 17 days we had about 56 meetings with different people. Meeting people like Gareth Prince, who was the first person who attempted, not legalisation, but he attempted to claim his rights in the Constitutional Court. We met amazing people on that boat trip. Then we came back and hit the ground running for our 420 D-Day party. And that certainly was the biggest highlight so far. Uh, we were hoping to get about 500 people or so, and it poured, it was rain, it was freezing cold, and we got 4,000 people. So that was a was a huge highlight. Just standing there up on that container downtown and looking down at all our supporters was the hugest rush. Don't be scared, eh? Don't be scared. Have the courage of your convictions to believe in your relationship with the plant. You're using the cannabis plant and you can be enlightened by it. You, for whatever reason you do use it. If you're using it for escapism, escape. If you're using it for mental agility and you're doing a huge PhD thesis, use it. But don't be scared of your use of it and come clean about it. And if you do get into trouble with it, just speak the truth because the problem with the, the DACA charges, they go on for a long, long time. You can, you can, um, you can postpone your charges for months and months on end, but you have to stay with the program and remember what you said. So if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said, because the truth is the truth. You are not a criminal. Always tell the truth. <laughs>